What's up, everybody? Welcome to IGN GameScoop. I'm your host, Damon Hatfield. Joining me this week is Tina Amini. Hello, from me and my cat tail. And Lion. <laughs> uh, Sam Claiborne. Hey, everybody. And Zach Ryan is joining us today. What's up, everybody? Welcome, Zach. And uh, Zach, would, he said he would like to open up the show by playing us a song on his bass guitar. Zach, take it away. Here we go. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to hear just a, a bass line. Like, that's what? never something that has ever been requested of anyone that plays Have bass. Have you ever owned an acoustic bass? No, those are for nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you talking to here? <laughs> well, we do have a great show for you this week. We're going to talk about uh, backwards compatibility on PlayStation 5, an absolutely insane, uh, completely random NES game that uh, is coming to Nintendo Switch very soon. But first, we do not yet know how much next-gen consoles are going to cost, but apparently we do know how much next-gen games are going to cost, and uh, they're going up. Prices are going up, ten dollars should be seventy dollars next gen. We'll talk about that more specifically. But Microsoft is doing what it can. Uh, good guy, Microsoft is doing what it can to try and alleviate some of that burden, some of that extra cost. Uh, they are reportedly telling developers that next gen upgrades should be wait, free. Wait, 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 Tina lost all of us because the cat just bit through her mic cable. <laughs> it's okay, it's just my headphones. Okay, <laughs> keep it going, Damon. Okay. Uh, this is a report from VGC that cites publishing sources with knowledge of Microsoft's next-gen policies. It says that Microsoft has been encouraging companies working on cross-gen games to offer upgrades at no additional cost. Now, of course, Xbox has smart delivery, but not every publisher is using that. We know Assassin's Creed and Cyberpunk 2077 are using it. Uh, this push from Microsoft will attempt to stop other publishers and developers from charging full price for next-gen versions of cross-gen games. Uh, EA has its own system, Dual Entitlement, LOL. Uh, it makes sure that if you buy <laughs> FIFA 21 or Madden NFL 21 on current-gen consoles, you'll be able to play the upgraded versions at no extra cost on next-gen. Mm -hmm. uh, if, they, if developers don't adopt the smart delivery policy, they have other options such as selling cross-gen bundles, which I think is what NBA 2K21 is doing. For a, You can pay $100 to get both uh, the current gen and the next gen versions of the games. At least that's better uh, than paying sixty dollars and then seventy dollars. You know, to play the same game. <laughs> yeah, that's true. My question is: oh. Would this policy uh, discourage developers from putting the work needed into the next gen versions? Uh, you, you know, so if they're if if they can't charge people for them, they can't upsell them for them. like what's 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 the point in putting wow. the development time into upskilling them? Yeah, that's a really backwards way of looking at it. I like it. <laughs> yeah, I okay. mean, I, I think, well, uh, it, it's it's funny. We, if you think about it that way, then there's no incentive uh, for, you know, them to do upgrades to make things look better in the new system, except for, for people that, like, didn't buy it on the last gen. And so it just matters in that launch window, right? Because, like, the last gen won't even matter after a bunch of people have upgrades. So this is really, like, a temporary problem that Microsoft is trying to, like, just get through. Well, I mean, if you think about how long a life uh, shelf life like the PlayStation 2 had, you know, there's PlayStation 2 games well into the PlayStation 3 era, and I think it's sort of dependent on NBA where people are, Yeah, I mean, I think it's sort of dependent on where people are playing those games, you know? Like, a lot of people might not be willing to pony up the, you know, estimated five $600 for a new platform when they can get a similar product uh, for, you know, less, $10 less on their previous generation console, right? Um, I don't know. I think that's a question that has to be addressed first. Yeah. Tina, where, you, where do you come down on all this? We still don't even have much of a scope on what that development looks like to amplify it for its next-gen version. So it kind of comes down to that, too, and the fact that, like, CD Projekt Red, granted, they're, like, a specific studio with a, a big size, um, sizable staff, uh, and I imagine won't have any problems uh, making money off of uh, Cyberpunk 2077. Um, but using them as an example, like they seem totally fine with offering that as a free upgrade. Uh, Xbox as a whole seems like that's something that they're clearly willing to ask of their developers since they're trying to obviously make smart delivery be this universal thing moving forward. So I think the point there is gain gamer trust and your audience's trust by offering them as many options as possible, especially within this transitionary phase. Um, and then I guess there are, you know, a range of people that can go for the pre what will be the previous gen, um, both because it'll be a budget decision, apparently for the games, as well as the consoles themselves. So maybe it just means more options. Well, yeah, definitely more options. But I, I wonder if it's all getting 
a little confusing. If the delivery mechanism for video games, buying video games, is getting too confusing, there are going to be multiple models of next-gen consoles that you have to decide which one you want to buy uh, that can take physical media or, or, or don't. Uh, Xbox has smart delivery, which will work on certain games to uh, get you from current-gen versions of games into the next-gen versions. But not all publishers are using it. Some publishers have their own versions, but then they have their own restrictions, like EA's doesn't apply uh, to, if you buy, <laughs> it only applies to like buying a physical version of Madden uh, for that dual entitlement feature. And then PlayStation doesn't seem to have any sort of smart delivery feature, although they have encouraged developers to make sure that any game certified after, what, July 14th going forward has to be, you know, compatible with both PS5 and PS4. It just all seems a little, it's a little, it's a little much. No. Well, it's a lot to keep track of. Lost. I can't keep track of all these kids and their video game systems. Mm. It is Come true, on, though. Man. Like, you're, you're going to have to, we're going to need wiki pages specifically for yeah. what are all the versions of this game that you can buy? What is the best deal? Well, Sam, <laughs> Sam was goofing, but I think he brings up, like, a pretty good point. Like, I think it might be daunting for the uninitiated, right? But I think for the majority of people that are, especially the folks that are going to come out for the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X day one, um, hardcore gamers, for lack of a better term, like they they know where they want to play. They know how they want to play. They already have those decisions in mind when they're coming to to that platform, right? So like, I, I totally I agree with both Damon and Sam in that like, it is very confusing for somebody that like is maybe not, up to date on everything that's happening, but also like to Sam's point, I think that that most people have already decided how they're going to play and where they're signing up and spending their money. I was more making the point that Damon is an old now. Um, I mean, that, that applies to three or four of us. But so. I have been an old for quite some time now. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think it just kind of ticked over. Um, I I, uh, I saw that you know they, they released the first box art for a PS5 game today, uh, mm -hmm. Miles Morales uh, Spider Man, and um, it looks a lot like the last two iterations of, of, of uh, PlayStation box art, which is disappointing. Like I remember when like, Oh, and like things look so different year to year, you know, in the, uh, the cardboard box era, let alone in the era where things are first going disc. So that's a little disappointing, but it also is going to add to confusion because like it, it, it just all the games look the same still. Like what's the, what is a PS five game? If it's like not that much upgraded and uh, everything is also the same, we'll, we'll have to see. I think it's going to be a well, few years before things feel really next gen. That's hmm. always how it is. Yeah. Especially if you consider and especially if you consider how wacky the PlayStation 5 console design is. Like they could have done anything with the boxes. Like they could they have put those in like a giant yeah. glass orb that you have to shatter or something yeah. to get to. Like <laughs> That would be pretty cool. Just pretty totally expensive. Uneven fins yeah. on the top of it would have been perfect. Uh, yeah. Are you guys cool with $70 games? Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a tough one because, like, nobody wants to admit to, like, yes, okay, I'm willing to pay more for this thing because, obviously, that is what people on the publishing side would prefer to do. But I think it's been, like, 14 years since there's been any change since uh, on the game on gaming price tags. So it makes sense to me. Like, it feels like it's a long time coming. Developers have told me for many years now, like, it's ridiculous that we're still charging $60. Like, there needs to be a metric that's increasing. Like, um, Ryan McCaffrey wrote a really good op-ed for us where he talked about like the cost of a movie ticket has changed exponentially since that time frame. The cost of even like a gallon of milk has changed in that time frame. Even if you just look at inflation for, from inflation uh, from the inflation perspective, like there needs to be something to account for that. But also just the scale of games that are being made now and like how many people are making those games and how much like he writes about this in his op ed too, but how much like crunch is contingent on making these big explosive triple A games. Like maybe that's something that we can help um, ease with something that's a little bit more comparable from a gaming price tag. So it makes sense. It feels like it's about time, essentially, even though it's not great for the consumer, obviously. Yeah, the last time I remember this conversation popping up was with Bobby Kotick and Activision. Like, I think he was one of the first people to start talking about how games are going to cost $60, and that was around the time of the Xbox 360 launch. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think we're well overdue for a price hike. Um, it is a bummer to a lot of consumers, you know, to have to pay 10 extra dollars per entry for every game. But uh, I think you made some really great points specifically about crunch, specifically about the size and the, the expectation of these games. Um, you know, it just takes a lot more manpower to get these kind of games off the ground, I think. So, man, devs did all kinds of stuff in the last 10 years to make up for not raising game prices. They added, I mean, that it's the era of DLC. Like the last decade mm -hmm. is the DLC era that just didn't exist before. And, um, that 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 and then adding like things that make you not sell your game back like 
shitty multiplayer modes and stuff like that have really been the trend. So like, I would hope that if you, you know, pay a little bit more money that you'd get like a, 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 almost like a better, more focused game, but it's really not, it, we're, it, we're already past the point where we should have raised, you know, 10 bucks to, to get these developers uh, some more, uh, bang for their buck but like i i i, I wanted i wanted to tell a story too uh i uh so pinball is is as locked to these quarter slots so like everybody thinks that pinball machines should cost a quarter they, they cost a quarter in, in you know 1975 i think was probably like the first time where that happens right and so that's like that's like five bucks now or something you know it's crazy so um and then in the 80s, they decided to like make them 50 cents and arcade machines were usually 25. And that like freaked people out. Like you guys remember Street Fighter was even 25 cents, right? So it's like that era wow. came and went. And then um, the, the now like pinball machines are usually like 50, 75 cents. And then the, some of them have dollar munchers. And the dollar ones are like when they're brand new and people like are really like, fine, I'll, I'll put in a dollar. So recently, uh, a local arcade that uh, somebody I know operates games at uh, put in the first $2 game. It was that new Willy Wonka game that we have in our office. And uh, it was like it sent like ripples throughout the the pinball community, and nobody played it. And like uh, that was the line. It was just that was the line. You just had to drop it to a dollar. Hmm. So, yeah, so it's like. Yes, yeah, it sometimes comes down to like the perception of that too, and then something else that Ryan was a little bit alluding to in his op-ed too is, um, and I've heard some uh, developers talk about this to me before, which is like, why aren't there other tiers? Like, obviously, indie games are priced at a lower metric too. Um, but there needs to be like a, or from their perspective, there needs to be like more pricing tiers between like independently made games and triple A level games with like a thousand people working on it or whatever else. And that makes a lot of sense to me too. But a $40 think Star Wars game is looking like a really good deal now. Okay. Yeah. But I think that that's, that's been part of the conversation for a long time about like, there is no, there's, there's just a real disparity between triple A games and indie games. There's not really that middle ground anymore. And we've seen some like essentially double A games. Um, I think what's, what's, good to keep in your the back of your mind when you're talking about like a $70 price point is how quickly games drop off in price. Sure. Um, especially third-party yeah. games, you know, like if something comes out in February or March, by December it'll be $30, you know. Um, so it's a bummer to not be there on day one, but if it's not a game that you're super excited about, you could probably just wait it out for a price to drop. Yeah, and maybe people will be more selective. Mm -hmm. And then there's also all the subscription models, like is this going to come out to be, you know, part of a package that you're yeah. already subscribed to that just kind of hits your, your shelves at some point and you play games in accordance to what's being presented to you by them. Those yeah, are going to get pushed option. hard. I think people really like them too. I mean, as long as the games aren't streaming, then they yeah. like they're already good deals, let alone if games become $70 as a sort of standard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, if they don't change the price for the subscription services, then you just got a better deal on your subscription service. There you go. <laughs> That's true. That's a good point. Um, yeah, th there's a few things I would point out. Uh, you know, a big game, a big AAA game, uh, one of the year's big blockbusters, works out to about, you're paying like a dollar an hour, right? You know, 50, 60 hour game. Uh, if it's a multiplayer game, a game as a service that you're going to pay play for years, it's like pennies an hour that you're paying. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, but, but, also, uh, I, I, there is a devil's advocate argument to be made here that seventy dollars is a lot of money. It just it just is. Like, not it, saying that. Yeah, I'm not saying it's yeah. not. And sixty bucks is too. And so it, it's like there. I just remember being a kid and like how rare it was to get a game. And like it is funny to think like that. Now, being an adult when you can control your own money and stuff, it's like it's it's a different situation. But like it is going to always be that way, I think, where like a game is going to be a special thing to get. And, you know, I don't know if that's good or bad. It's just like that's absolutely what happens when the market changes like this. I, I agree. Seventy dollars is a lot of money. I just for me, it, it it makes me feel better about spending it when I think about how much, you know, yeah. I'm getting. Yeah, you know, yeah. Out of, for how much time or how much I'm actually spending per that's hour. That's the argument that you take to your parents, right? You say, listen, mm -hmm. it's yeah. a 70 hour game. I said, wouldn't you pay me a dollar an hour not to be in your hair all the time? I, I had that argument with my parents last week and they're like, stop telling us about video games. Yeah, exactly. We don't care anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Parents like, we bought you Final Fantasy 1 already. Yeah. Yeah, what also, did you want? 30 years ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also, everyone who's been gaming for a long time has stories like this. I bought Bionic Commando for $55 in 1988 at KB wow. Toys. That's, that's $120 adjusted for inflation. Um, so wow. that's also something to think about. And then the final thing I would say is I do want to acknowledge that uh, we're, we're not typical, like we're uh, privileged gamers. We get a lot of games for free. So yep. I don't want to like, don't want to like discount, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, Games increasing in price is a big deal to a lot of people. Different How many hours did you play Bionic Commando for? I mean, man, a lot. 
A Did you get your money it, back? Right? Yeah, for sure. Definitely got my money back on that one. <laughs> well, I didn't get it back, but I got my money right. back. Right. You got your money's worth, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you uh, would have kept that box, you could have got 55 bucks for it right now. That's true. Bet well, you got your money well, back. Would it, how much is yeah. a yeah, and it in? <laughs> Complete in box, CIB. Looking up, looking up. Bionic There's here. no way a complete Bionic Commando is less than $55. That game is a very desirable game that people trash the boxes for. Okay, loose price, $10. Mm -hmm. Check. Complete, complete, uh, $53. Wow! Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. New is 177 Graded is 325 Wow. What does graded mean? Sam. You send it to a, uh, a company, I think there's one in Colorado, and then they like put it in a little acrylic box and put a number on it. Okay. Comics has this too. Yeah. First cool. of all, a new copy. You're telling me that somewhere out there, I could just buy a new copy of Bionic Commando in the box <laughs> right now. Oh, so, please tell me where that is. I will absolutely pay 170 bucks for that. That would be the coolest thing ever. That would be pretty cool. It's one of my favorite games of all time. It's a great game. Uh, let's move on. Uh, we have another Sony patent to talk about. They're just every week. There's a new Sony patent. They're patent crazy over there at Sony. <laughs> <laughs> this one suggests uh, PlayStation, uh, presumably the PlayStation Five could be backwards compatible with previous generations of PlayStation uh, Three, Two, and One, just like Xbox Series X is being uh, backwards compatible with every generation of Xbox. The patent reads a large number of game titles across PS1, 2, and 3 and various generations of game consoles can be stored and used via the cloud gaming library. These games can be run on a virtual machine that mimics the operating system associated with each game console. Uh, which So it kind of sounds like a cloud backwards compatible streaming service, so like PlayStation Now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, go ahead, Sam. No, no. I was just going to say, like, with Sony patents, they do, they seriously do end up patenting the most weird things. So it's like, is this something that they're going to expand on with, with now? Is this something that they're going to use to replace it? Is this something that they're just putting in there because there are some people researching it and they just want to see where it goes? Is this something where they're just putting their flag on it so no one else can? Who's to say? And what if uh, Xbox put out PlayStation 1, 2, and 3 games? They'd be <laughs> really fool. <laughs> they didn't get that patent. <laughs> Exactly. I, mean, I do think it's interesting that they're talking about the operating systems and stuff for those systems to come into yeah. play. Like that, that's pretty wild. Uh, and Sony's got to address how they're going to talk about backwards compatibility because Microsoft ate their lunch, you know, all through the last generation, and it looks like they're going to continue to do so. I think that PS5 backwards compatibility is going to be a major selling point if they can actually pull it off. Yeah. yeah, especially while that you're right, like especially as that is X, one of Xbox's big sticking points and the thing that they've been trying to present is like, look how accessible these next consoles are going to be. Same thing with smart delivery, like they're just trying to make it as open ended as possible. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the conversational beat Sony hasn't really nailed quite yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like an emulation solution. Um, and the way it is now, I actually I wasn't aware of this till today. Um, there are PlayStation 3 games available through PS Now, but they aren't emulated. They run, it runs them natively on PS3 hardware from server farms. Mm -hmm. oh. I just thought that was interesting. Really? They're connected? Yeah. You, you have to play them connected? What do you mean? Online, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. Hmm. But um, that PS Now is a game streaming service. You can download some of Yeah, you already have the NES, yeah. That yeah. makes sense. Hmm. hmm. It works surprisingly well too. It's gotten much better. Yeah. Than when the it first thing about, it. I mean, the, the the I like backwards libraries being available, and that that's all fine. Like the price of those games is like really questionable, especially when Nintendo's you know uh, uh, already pricing retro games pretty high. Like, what were the the weird like arcade games you were playing that are like priced at like twenty bucks and stuff sometimes? Well, they're but, all eight. They're all eight dollars. There is like some weird outliers there, right? But anyway, uh, so uh, I, I always really do miss the idea that you can just put in, like you can go out and collect old PlayStation discs and put them in your PlayStation. And like the PS3 for certain models of that, you could absolutely do that. You could go build a library of old disc games and put a PS1 game or for some of them a PS2 game in and they'd play. And it was so cool. And I, I really do miss that. Like we're still using disc-based medium media and i really wish that you could uh, just stick them in the disk drive but my my biggest gaming my biggest gaming regret was getting rid of my 60 gigabyte ps3 because i had just like an insane library of ps1 and ps2 games mm -hmm. that i sold with it when i bought my playstation 4 and i look back at that now and it's like there's so many of those games that aren't available anywhere else that i wish that i would have kept you know yeah that's the one that hardware in it 
Mm-hmm. Did you just assume they were going to be ported over at some point? You're like, eh, I'm done with these. I just, yeah. Just I, I mean, think at the time, well, at the time, like, I just wanted a PlayStation 4 really badly. And I also, mm. yeah, like you're saying, like, I thought, well, some they'll figure out some way to get these yeah. on this system. Surely. Like, these are a collection of awesome games. Like, surely they'll figure out how to get this. You know? Yeah. Why wouldn't they? Yeah. Still waiting. Yeah. Lo and behold. <laughs> maybe, maybe they're working on it right now. Yeah, exactly. Just 10 Every years ago. Every time I see like a game console on the street, I take a picture of it, or sometimes I take them. And How often is that happening? Yeah, yeah, like, yes, it, happens like, it happens so much. It happens so much. And the other day I was at the very top of, you know, the, the hill in San Francisco. Um, I forget the name of it, but it has the big cross that's in Dirty Harry. It's, oh, yeah. It's called uh, Mount something. Um, it's a... Uh, it's really interesting. And so I was up there and I was like, cause I, I can, I can jog there from my house. And I uh, was <laughs> at the bus stop, like walking fast and there's a PlayStation two standing upright. This is like, you know, a couple, like a week ago, I could like send you guys a picture of it. <laughs> it was just sitting there next to the trash can, like the public bus stop trash can, not in front of a house. Like somebody carried a PlayStation two over there, right. set it upright. It had the little stands to keep it upright. I wonder if they're making a statement. <laughs> yeah, and I remember the first time I've t- told the story in the show, so I'll tell a different very ver- version of it. But the first time I saw like an Xbox 360 on the street, I was like, "Oh my god!" Like people waited overnight for like a week for that, and like they was were selling on eBay for like 600 bucks. So I still that's the most common system I see. And the, and the, there's an underpass uh, that I go through by my house the other day. And there was this, there was an Xbox, and it was it was broken. I think a car had run over it, but there was this giant uh, driving stick for it. Like just huge, just like a massive piece of plastic that had also probably been run over, but you couldn't tell because those things are going to like outlast humanity so <laughs> easily. But every good guitar hero controller and rock band drum kit and like stupid driving thing, those just go straight to the dumps and they are never going to break down. <laughs> San Francisco, you I wanna, just the street. I want to believe that it's the result of like an epic rage quit. Just someone was so pissed <laughs> yeah, off, took absolutely. the bus, like I'm putting it in this trash specifically <laughs> for all to see at the top of this hill. <laughs> My favorite thing is when you find those, like I, I, this, I know, I know this sounds weird, but it happens a lot, especially when you're, you know, you exercise on the streets, right? Like you see this stuff and uh, I, I usually find like the console and if there's a box there, there's games in it. And so like, there's so many times where I've like jogged home or like been walking home with like this big stupid thing of like games. And now in a pandemic, I know, I'm not as quick to pick them up, although mm. I have picked up some games in the pandemic on the ground. Zach, we got to extreme close up. Whoa! <laughs> Sorry. Uh, what's I'm still dial- I'm still dialing in my camera. I just like, I forgot that that focus assist pops forward like that. Sorry, mm. everybody. That's <laughs> it was good. It was at, a good moment. Quick look at the pores on my nose. So. <laughs> a little check in with the listeners. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're not quite there yet. <laughs> what do we say when Hold we get through? Uh, I'll remind check you. Check in. Uh, let's move on. Would it uh, surprise anyone to learn that 80% of Capcom's game sales are now digital? 80%. It is a lot, but like, especially when you just look at it on the numbers like that, but yeah, nope. Especially considering the discless future we're heading towards. What are their big games? I mean, I, I think of Resident Evil and Monster Hunter, but do, do they have maybe some kind of, you know, mobile library that we don't know about that counts for mm-hmm. something? Like, I, I, I just don't have. I think maybe we've all forgotten about Super Puzzle Fighter 2. <laughs> Super Puzzle Fighter 2, right? Uh, I would never. <laughs> I would never forget. <laughs> How dare uh, you? <laughs> Disney's, Disney's Aladdin and Disney's mm-hmm. Lightning. Damon, is that 80% this year or? It's, a, it's past fiscal year. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, that kind of makes sense. I, I have to imagine that digital sales have skyrocketed in the last four or five months just due to you know people yeah. not wanting to go and pick up a physical copy. Yeah, yeah that's that. another good point. The, the discrepancy that gets me is 80% of their sales are digital, but if we asked our audience, the IGN audience, uh, if, they want, if they prefer physical or digital games, 80% aren't going to say they prefer buying digital. I think that's, that's something unique to, I think that's something unique to gamers. Like I think a lot of gamers want to have something tangible and physical, whereas like uh, you know, people that play casually or whatever might not be so tied to ha- like having a box or a disc. Hmm. This is but I don't know. Price. This is the, it's because they want to sell it back. Like, like the, the calculation for owning a game right now is more that it's like a $25 purchase because you buy it for 60 bucks and then you sell it back for 40. Um, yeah, I just remember stringing those, those purchases along. I remember a really, really fun one, which is like beautiful Joe to Prince of Persia sands of time to, you know, one other game on the game, in the GameCube era, where it's like, I probably paid like 10 or 15 bucks for each of those games, you know, because you can sell them back. I'll be very curious to see how many discless versus 
disc full uh, consoles, both Sony <laughs> and Xbox disc. end up saying full, just full of them, all every single one. <laughs> Actually, that would be nice, but just rotated like a CD changer. Oh, <laughs> Remember, Remember CD when, changers? Yeah. <laughs> Remember those like kind of like had like a runaway. And so like when you had like a hot car, you'd open your trunk and then like in the trunk, there's like a disc changer that had like 50. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just ready to go. Huge cartridge. Yeah. So, there you yeah. go. Yeah. I'll be curious to see what those numbers are. Cause I have I, to yeah. imagine if they're investing in that kind of the console, like a, yes, it's a budget version, but B um, it also means that there must be a market for it. Oh, I know. And then, Sony looks at the, this is just this is the sales data. Uh, the vast majority of games are being bought digitally. Sony looks at that. All right, now we'll just make an all digital console. So I, what what doesn't add up to me is like why doesn't our audience feel the right. same way? Have it's we pulled them on that? Games back. Yeah, we yeah. just pulled them. Damon has uh, the results. Ah, uh, that's why I see. It was like over fifty percent want the want the because there's three options and over fifty percent want the hard hard copy yeah well we um, should re-poll everyone when the prices of each go um go yeah. up for the consoles and see if it changes our minds mm-hmm. yeah where do you guys fall do you do discs or digital if it's a game I'm, I'm like i i think i'm gonna really like and keep forever like i sometimes will even go to, for a collector's edition if it doesn't have statues i won't buy things with statues so like if it has like a nice thicker box with like like usually like the fire emblem games like i really like how they have like a booklet and stuff with them yeah that's where i'll go physical I'm mostly so digital, so the one thing that would suck, though, is that if you had to get, and again, we're privileged gamers, so um, most of the time we get codes. Very rarely these days do we actually operate off of disks, but we have, yeah. well, back when we were using our office, we had, like, a library system that was disk-specific, so I imagine, like, that might influence some of it, too. Yeah. I'm mostly digital. What If I buy a physical, it's uh, an impulse buy at Target. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, I, haven't, I haven't played Luigi's Mansion 3 yet. Okay. And if I like had the the time and like thought to think about this a lot, I would get limited limited run games. Like I think those are super cool. Like I love the I idea was, of a yeah. physical copy for a digital game that like usually you've already had a couple months to be like, oh, I love that game. You know, like Spelunky or something. I would totally yeah. get physical copies for, but I just I just don't. Those are almost they're just almost impossible to get because they are. Yeah, limited. yeah, and they're that's the thing. It's like the investment to get those is not paying for them. It's like yeah. like refreshing a web page, which yeah. I'm just like I'm not gonna do that. I can do that either. Speaking of digital games, uh, three new games added to Nintendo Switch Online. A little game called Donkey Kong Country. <laughs> yeah. Natsume, Natsume Championship Wrestling. Yeah. Again, mm-hmm. again, some of the, some of these are odd choices. Which has um, generic, generic, weird video game wrestlers in it. Yeah. When I was watching the footage, I thought I saw Andre the Giant, but then it was just Natsume Champion. He had a different yeah. name, like like uh, Big Starman Andy. They call him Big Andy. The big game, yeah. the giant. Uh, is anybody excited about Donkey Kong Country? Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I Go ahead. Tina. Really? I already don't like it. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, so I grew up playing that, um, and my brothers loved playing it. And while I'm still in Austin, uh, I'm definitely going to download it and make them play it because it's very hard to get them into any kind of games these days, which is funny. Um, but yeah, that's the kind of thing where it's like, remember when we played this as kids, and just being able yeah. to share it around. Like, I'm excited for that. Well, I think yeah, a lot of people. That's definitely an experience I've had with Donkey Kong is that when I have like, you know, when people are over, it's like if you're going to like if you have somebody staying with you and they want to play an old game, it's going to be Donkey Kong Country or Super Mario World. Like those are the ones that you can like start from the beginning and just like super casually trade off levels and play through them. Donkey Kong Country is like it still looks really cool and the music is awesome. But uh, it's it's really frustrating to do the thing I've always wanted to do in it, which I did back in the day, which is like get everything. Like it's just hard. It's just like it's it's hard because you're, you're, the character's too big and things are clunky and it's just frustrating and the game's a mess. Um, but it's a beautiful mess and it's a historic mess. So I think everybody should play it at some point. Is that yeah? Um, has great historical was, significance. To I'm gonna say the same thing. I'm gonna say the same thing that I said here that I said on Nintendo Voice Chat yesterday when we were talking about this. But uh, I recommend that if you're hungry for a Donkey Kong Country game uh, on the Nintendo Switch, play Tropical Freeze because that's mm. like one of the most underrated 2D platformers I think mm. ever made, and uh, I really love that game. And it also stars Donkey Kong and his family of Kong. What Donkey Kong's in that no one? No kidding. Too? Yeah, I know. <laughs> little known fact. Little trivia for you there. That has yeah. a lot of Funky Kong in it too. It does. There is a lot of Funky Kong. So Donkey Kong Country, Natsume Championship Wrestling are fine. But the game, the game that people are really excited about is the Immortal. So weird. NES. 
which is a game. It's one of those games that I feel like I'm the only one that played as a kid. Did you play it back in the day? Because because yeah. I I read about that game in Nintendo Power and like yeah. I I know it from the images in Nintendo Power because it's like an isometric game and you're a wizard. Yeah. And it's really recognizable. And like I remember thinking like that looks so cool. And I know it was like a PC port and stuff like that. But like I never I never visited that game as an adult in any way. And I don't think I played it as a kid. There was not a PC port. It was originally an Apple II game that was That's ported right. to the yeah. NES and yeah. to the Genesis. I don't know why it wasn't ported to Super Nintendo. Uh, the NES version is not the ideal way to play this game, but it is impressive that they got it working on the NES at all because, uh, like Sam said, isometric fantasy adventure game where you're a wizard exploring dungeons, searching for your uh, master who has gone missing. And the whole appeal is that the, the animations in the game are incredible. And there's all these really, really cool death animations, both for you and for you, the enemies. And it gets, for the time, 1990, it was like shockingly graphic and gory. They toned down the blood for the NES version, but uh, on the Sega Genesis one, you can still, you can check it out in its full pixelated, uh, gory glory. It's great. Uh, I found an article on the make, the Developed making. Developed by one person. Yeah, the, well, the original Apple II version was. And published by EA. This was an EA game cool. back in the day. I found a, an article on the making of Immortal with a, uh, some quotes from that, that creator. Uh, this, the article says, the incredible enemy death animations were the icing on the cake, and unsurprisingly, they caused the design team a few headaches when it came to porting the game to the kitty-friendly home console market. Wow. Uh, the uh, developer said, Sega were fine with the death animations, but Nintendo weren't. They met us get rid of the blood on the NES version. This was standard procedure as far as Nintendo was concerned. Harvey, the developer and his team, so used to having total freedom when coding for the Apple II, could do nothing but comply with the request. He says it's kind of hard to have a wizard's head blow up without blood, but we did what we could. <laughs> Regardless of this, Harvey is proud Sparkle. of what his team... Had, yeah, yeah, lots of what, sparkles and hats. Half sweat. Lots of sweat. Uh, <laughs> Harvey is proud of what his team achieved with the limited power of Nintendo's aging 8-bit machine. So the graphics on the NES were unprecedented at the time. Uh, indeed, when placed alongside the 16-bit version of the Nintendo port, doesn't look as shoddy as you might expect. So I'm just like, this is like a really cool artifact that's just so random that it is resurfaced uh, now on the yeah. Nintendo Switch Online. I recommend people play it, but use a guide because it is a, a trial and error game. Like you're just going to randomly die. There's lots of items in the game that have one specific use. And if you use it at the wrong time, you'll get stuck. Uh, so just play along with a guide. <laughs> and also, there's also a cool little story, and the ending is really cool too. There's ac actually a little bit more to the story than you think. Mm. Okay. Super well, I watched cool. the ending, and it was great. Yeah, right. It's super cool that they're bringing these like kind of deep cut games to Nintendo Switch Online. Like, I'm way more interested in these like late era NES games than getting another port of like Super Mario Brothers three or whatever. You know, yeah, it, exactly. it would just be awesome. nice to get like a grip of them at once instead of yeah. like, one every month. Like, I, mm. I just like I want to even... explore the library, and it's not really working out that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not even every month anymore. It's every. It's just sort of randomly that whenever up. now, yeah. Um, and then another quick reminder that uh, Bloodstained Curse of the Moon 2 is out tomorrow, I believe. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Got to get that. Yeah, so definitely going to be playing that one. Cool. Let's check in with the listeners. What do we say? What do we say? Hey, listeners. Hey, hi, listeners. Thank you. Listeners, remember you can always reach us at the email address, gamescoop at IGN.com, just like Keaton in Kansas City, Missouri did. So that I'm in my mid-20s and I've played video games most of my life. I've played on most of the consoles from the PlayStation 2 generation on, and I'm familiar with or have played the Nintendo and Sony consoles before then. However, you Omega Cops often bring up consoles I'm not familiar with. What is the Virtual Boy? How are there like four Sega consoles I'm not familiar with? <laughs> Could you quickly run through the lesser-known consoles of the 90s for me and other listeners my age? Sure. Hmm. But yeah. yeah, of course we can do that. Do we work backwards from 2000 or forwards from 1990? Well, I sent you categories. Yeah, yeah. He, he made specific, a specific outline. Yes. We don't have to go by it, but I just wanted to like hit on some themes because I, I just I think all consoles, and it's kind of by era, but the, to, to his exact point about um, how there's like four Sega systems, that's because of add-ons. And um, and because there was the Master System in the 80s, which was like a head-to-head -to, -head to the NES from Sega that didn't go very far, it wasn't very popular, they put out the Genesis, which everybody knows about. And then instead of like saying like, oh, um, you know, we should put out a new system or, or something like that, they're like, let's let's see if we can get people to buy a disk system that attaches to it. So that's where the Sega CD came Sega from. CD. You, you had to have the Genesis. And then they put out a thing called the 32X, the 32X. Which, put, which put 
bigger cartridges in your system. It was like a, it was like a, a thing that went between your cartridge and your Genesis that you could still have the CD attached to. Uh, that wasn't the only system to do that because the TurboGrafx-16 did that with the TurboGrafx CD, and then they had a thing too called the arcade card. So like there was this like parallel thing where they like they didn't go to next gen they're just like eh, maybe we can get people to just expand their system and the expansions were like 200 bucks at the time too like the sega cd i think was 250 bucks or 300 bucks new so that wasn't cheap it's pretty funny um but i also wanted to just like and you guys can can definitely interrupt me at any time but i wanted to talk about the the shiny disc explosion uh, especially because uh in the mid in you know in like the early 90s um games were a thing and then multimedia was a thing, and the and, and that was like this big term, and it was like you could watch you could watch movies on on a disc, like that was really amazing to people. I don't know why, like I still can't really explain it. Like you could watch it on a tape, you could watch stuff stuff on TV, but people really like the idea of watching full motion video on discs. So there's like ten systems that came out around that, uh, and I had a list here: the uh, Philips CDI, which was a thousand bucks new. <laughs> That would, wow. that would be $1,900 today. Can you imagine getting wow. a system for $1,900? Um, that one was funny because it had three Nintendo games on it. Yeah. There, there four, yeah. sorry. Four Nintendo games uh, uh, and a Mario. There's three Zelda games and a Mario game. Um, Hotel Mario, which is pretty funny. Uh, and then there's a, 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 so that was like CD-based. And then the 3DO is a famous CD-based system with a mascot this game on it called Gex. And then a bunch of other games uh, that had the first Need for Speed on it. But that one was also 700 bucks, right? So you're seeing like sense of theme here. Like who could buy these systems? Like we wouldn't buy a $700 system now. Like that was, that would have been astronomically expensive. Uh, Don't forget uh, Neo might. Geo. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the Neo Geo was a system that, well, there's another theme here where arcades uh, were still pacing consoles like just ahead. Everybody wanted to have the arcade system at home. So Neo Geo was like, let's just make the same system at home. Well, of course, like you can do that. You can make a, a big cartridge that goes into arcade machines and switches out your games, but uh, your home version is going to cost 650 bucks, which is $1,300 in today's money. So it's like these, you can sense a the theme here. Like all the systems that, that were super advanced and cool of that era were like completely astronomically unaffordable. And then the games are disappointing. Not Neo Geo. Neo Geo was like cool fighting games. If you like that sort of thing, but all of these disc based games were all, um, mainly full motion video based. So it'd be like, you'd watch a movie or like, you know, and then play a little bit of something with like graphics overlaid over it. Like that's what all of these games were for this. And the, the pioneer laser active was a laser disc one, the Apple Pippin Apple put out a system. That was a big mistake, but there's all these systems, right? So that was, that, but what, what, what's unique about them is that they all had discs. They're all really expensive and the game sucked. The PlayStation decided to focus on 3d and they were like, oh, we don't, you know, there's some full motion video on PlayStation, including Resident Evil 1. But uh, it was really about 3D, and they figured out a system that could do 3D games. And, like, that's all people cared about. And then the Nintendo 64 was fine, too, uh, for that. But, like, really, like, all of these systems that were so expensive, like, just they couldn't play 3D games. The Sega Saturn was kind of like that, too. That was the follow-up to the 30, 32X. Well, the follow-up to the Sega Genesis, yeah. really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was like Genesis CD 32X were like two Christmases, and then they did the the Saturn. And people were like, by that point, they're like, "You just made me build a stack of hardware. Like, why would I ever, why would I ever buy another Sega system?" And a lot I, of people skipped the Saturn. I remember being so confused by the 32X specifically because I had a neighbor who got a 32X, and I just it I couldn't wrap my head around what it was. It wasn't a different system, but it wasn't the same system. Then it played some of the games, but had a different input. It was like what is this thing? I, I just could not understand it when I was a kid. Three power cables it took to power a 32X, a C Sega CD, and a Genesis in this big stack. It was completely crazy, um, which I had all those, too. And then I definitely got mad at Sega at that point, so I skipped the Saturn. And then I, then I didn't want to play a Dream Dreamcast after that, either. And then the Saturn was kind of an in-between system. Again, like it just sucked at 3D, so like it had a bunch of like really cool space shooters and fighting games on it. But like it couldn't really do the stuff that the PlayStation 1 did. And so I think people just really at one point just run to just hop to polygons and like the PlayStation yeah. absolutely did that first. They did it so well and it shouldn't have because it's hard to do that on a CD back then. But then, you know, that became the standard. Um, the, you didn't the, answer. Uh, you didn't answer Keaton's question. About Virtual Boy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, so uh, Nintendo, uh, but so Nintendo always had the Super Nintendo it was was happening at the same time as the Game Boy. And then the Nintendo 64 was going to come out at some point. But in between then, they were they were trying to think about 3D, right? Like this is the this is the theme. And so they thought, uh, well, why don't we do a system that's like can do 3D graphics, 
that can also do them in stereo vision. And so they, the guy that designed the system designed the Game Boy, brilliant designer, Gunpei Yokoi. He, he designed this system that you put your face in and then you look at, uh, you know, two different, two different tiny screens that hit to each eyeball and everything's in red crystal graphics. It's just <laughs> bright red on an inky black background. It's horrible. It's well, not only that, not only that, but like the system itself came on this funny tripod that you had to yeah. sit up on like a desk and then like put your face in it. And like, I, I wanted one so badly when I was a kid, like when they first came out, I wanted one so bad. And then I look at it now and it's like, God, I'm glad I didn't have that. Like, <laughs> I'm so glad I didn't ask my parents to buy me that. Like, yeah. It was really silly. And like it had the thing with the virtual boys that like, it was so uncomfortable to play. You can't play with a friend because your friend can't see it. Like how important is that to games when you think about it? It's like a television that your friend is looking at. In any mm. game, right? Like as soon as you cut somebody out, it's like you're not you're you're not having experience that Tina just talked about with playing with her brothers, where everybody has these fond memories of playing Donkey Kong. Like you completely cut that out because you're just in your own little in your little head. Um, so that system also had like you know a total of like under thirty games ever. Like in America, it was like more in the fifteen to twenty range. So it just came and went, and 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 it was released like months before the Nintendo 64's marketing cycle. So I guess the idea was to kind of run it concurrently with the Nintendo 64, but boy, they just abandoned it. They just completely yeah. chucked it. And then the next Christmas, it was all Nintendo 64. But I remember cool. Nintendo Power switching over and having the Virtual Boy section for like five months. You know? <laughs> it was so sad. Not, not, only, not only did they abandon it, but they also like swept it under the rug for decades. Like yeah. they wouldn't talk about it. They didn't put it in any games. There was no references to it anywhere. Like they, yeah. they I'm disliked that so anything. much. Yeah, right. Like in the places where you think it would show up, they were like so disappointed in that performance that they're like, let's just uh, forget that that happened for a while. Like yeah. now they, there's been a few references to it in first party games and stuff like that. But like, yeah. Well, now that time. VR is now that VR is a thing, they're like, wait, we invented that first. Actually, remember the Virtual Boy? And then it becomes irrelevant again. <laughs> like when distinct thing too, where the controller was really more like a modern controller than anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it could have you could have looked at the PlayStation controller at the time, but it, it looks like a GameCube controller or a PlayStation controller a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not too surprising that Nintendo didn't want to talk about the Virtual Boy for so long because uh, at the time. It was released. Nintendo was on like a 10-year winning streak of just dominating video games with the NES and the Super Nintendo and Game Boy. Like they could do no wrong. And then the virtual boy is just like a brick wall that they just hit. Um, Sam, yeah, they weren't you, used to that failure. Don't you yeah. own like every virtual boy game? Yeah, th that was an easy collection to complete. Yeah. <laughs> I'll bring him down for Game Scoop next time. I should, I should nice. bring um, I uh, I should mention too that the creator of the Virtual Boy very tragic uh, tragically died right right then so he was uh, involved in a, in a really sad traffic accident and uh, he he had been in Nintendo for decades so he yeah. again I, I mentioned the Game Boy he's also like the creator of Metroid and Kid Icarus like the co creator of those games like 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 absolutely now if we were talking about two people at Nintendo it would always be Gunpei Yokoi and, and Shigeru Miyamoto so like. That was a fail for him, and it wasn't like you know. I hope it wasn't a source of shame or anything, but like yeah. that was like a, a really sad note to go out on, and like possibly a reason that we don't talk about him a lot because you know we we we, had, we already had some distance from the Game Boys from the, at that point, which was his biggest success by far. You and I have had this conversation before, Sam, but I think that there's also a case to be made for a third party, and that's Takashi Tezuka as like the the third pillar of Nintendo for sure, because he he directed and, and led so so many of those classic uh, NES and SNES games, and Mario Two and Metroid Prime. Like what mm -hmm. if we? <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, I uh, should also mention uh, I I will skip most of the stuff that I'd written down, but like the Atari Jaguar was a system in the mid nineties. Oh, yeah. Funny. So Atari, like, you know, tried to come back and they made this like cool system that was like black and angled and like kind of looked like extreme. It looked like a toilet. <laughs> yeah. And it had, but it had a really, it had an analog stick, but it was terrible. And uh, because it, I don't think it, it didn't reposition. Um, but uh, it, uh, that system was actually marketed as like a cheap system. It was like, it's cheaper than the PlayStation and it can do all this. But again, terrible at 3D, but really good at sprites. And so it had this this Alien versus Predator game, which is just this like mass of pixels on screen, just like just sprites everywhere, just on top of each other and looking crazy. And it's one of the coolest looking games ever. The Jaguar had a bad controller. Yeah, mm -hmm. just the worst.
Uh, okay, we got to move on. But thank you for that history lesson, Sam. Oh, yeah. uh, this is Brian Shoemaker in Chicago, Illinois. He says, hello, Mega Cops. First, a big thank you to Damon and the rest of Camp Goose for keeping my favorite podcast going strong these recent months at Consistently High Quality. Listening to you guys on my daily walks has been one thing keeping me from uh, going during, keeping me going during this lockdown. I have an important question. Some background. I just started Bloodstained Curse of the Moon. One look at the art style, the Baroque costumes and characters, the absurd monsters, the Metroidvania mechanics and crafting trees, and thought, oh yeah, this is a Shoemi game. Remember, his name is, uh, last name is Shoemaker. Shoemaker. Uh, my girlfriend said it looks stupid, which cemented my conviction. Everyone loves your Damien Game shoutouts, and last week's Mid-Year Damien Awards got me thinking, what about your co-hosts? We all want to know what makes a Clayby game and an Amini game. I don't know why I went with Clayby oh, game instead of... <laughs> well, game last just names so are a good nickname way, yeah. Is it visuals? Is it mechanics? Here are my guesses. For Sam, that anything that doesn't try to tell a story, preferably contained in an arcade cabinet or pinball machine. Do you nail it? I mean, I wouldn't even count those as games, though. I never thought about it that way. <laughs> uh, for Tina, he guesses any game with a cat. Definitely. I mean, it, it adds, like, an, an uh, increase factor for sure. But there's lots of elements that would make an Amini game, and I'm glad it was an Amini game um, as, the, as the reference. I would say um, anything with a good story or good characters, like something that can kind of ground you from beginning to end, because I have a bad habit of not finishing games unless it's mm -hmm. keeping my uh, interest. Um, anything horror-ish, anything sci-fi-ish, uh, especially in the first-person shooter genre, but then also anything open-world-ish, anything with, like, an RPG or any kind of, like, progression leveling system makes an Amini game. Um, lots of different elements. You like big single-player games, right? That would be a... Yeah. Yeah, but then, like, there are first-person shooter games that aren't, like, just military versions, like a Left 4 Dead or something that I'll play until the end mm -hmm. of the Earth. But they don't really make things of that nature anymore, so. Yeah. They're making Back for Blood. That's true. And there was a canceled Left 4 Dead 3 uh, project, as we learned from mm -hmm. the Final Hours documentary stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like arcade machines, and I really like working on them, but like I don't like playing those games unless they're in the machine. So I wouldn't say that that's like my genre to go to. Like I don't collect a bunch of digital versions of arcade games. I think it's a bummer to play them that way. But I love going to like a big convention and playing a bunch of weird games. It's like my favorite thing in the world. Um, my type of game is uh, open world, usually, but generally it has to have um, some sort of uh, hidden, a lot of hidden stuff, a lot of things to discover. And and things that are like surprising and clever. And and there's two, like two prototype games I would talk about for that. One is Super Mario Brothers. One like when that game came out, like it, it's it, it was not it wasn't fun as a, because it was a platforming. Like it wasn't about jumping around. It was about like finding warp zones and and uh, and hidden blocks that have one ups in them and stuff like that. And boy, did that series like really take off and go off on like finding secrets. Like Mario sixty four is probably the best example of it. Where like that castle is full of just amazing cool stuff to like discover and just like you're like wow. I can't can't believe they hid that there and it's not it's not like a miss type, type game or something where it's like you'll never find everything you have to use a strategy guide you totally find it all it's it's really cool and maybe you go online and you look at like the really in-depth stuff eventually but um you know and then the modern versions of that are breath of the wild like that's like my my favorite game like i just love it like and it's because it's just like it lets you just go out and explore and find stuff that's like cleverly hidden that's my favorite type of game you like games that are good for guides <laughs> I do like games that are good for guides. And it you know happens what? to be. Yeah, that's like a trend now that to make uh, games that have this this kind of fake open world quality where it's like, you know, something like on the, the thing that you're searching for, the collectible or whatever, is like not well hidden. It's just sitting on the map and then they tell you where it is on the map. So you're just running to get it. That drives yeah. me crazy. And Assassin's Creed is really guilty of this. I, 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 I really, and, and like to on the opposite end, like Tomb Raider has some pretty cool hidden stuff in it right like i really like how like the tombs are actually intricate platformy puzzles and then some of the uh, collectibles are like you have to shoot something in the distance or like kind of find those like that's really smart and it's not as smart as breath of the wild but it's like it's a th that's a kind of happy medium where i'll really like that type of game but you also like games with cheat codes right i love games with cheat codes <laughs> or cheat codes <laughs> Like on the reverse side of that, um, before we get to what I assume will be Zacky games, uh, mm -hmm. to give you a name for it, uh, also love anything with dialogue trees, even though like all the, the concept of moral gray areas and like, you know, rights and wrongs and whatever else. And the concept of like you owning your story never really pans out by the end of it. I still really enjoy like feeling like it is up until the last 10 minutes where I'm like, nope, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. 
That's a good point. I do like dialogue uh, options along that line. Yes. If I yeah. if I can put skill points towards dialogue options in a game to like think I have the cool talky way out of this, like for some reason I I like really love that. Well, that's a whole other level because it's combining like a leveling system with dialogue choices, yeah, so exactly. it gives you more power and influence I'm over it. For that, I don't know why. Yeah. Weird. All right, Zach. What makes a Zachy game? Uh, similar to Sam, I like open world action RPGs. Breath of the Wild is my all time favorite game. I think that that's probably where I, I gravitate towards the most. I also like, I love Metroidvanias, 2D Metroidvanias. Uh, you know, uh, Shumi specifically mentioned uh, uh, <laughs> Curse of the Moon, and I'm yep. really, really excited for that next Bloodstained game that comes out, I think, this week. It's um, tomorrow, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, love, I love 2D platformers. Um, I, I, I'm a co-host of our Nintendo show. I love a lot of first-party Nintendo stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that the, those are probably like the hallmarks of what makes a Zacky game. Oh, Souls Nintendo games, games. Soulborn. Soulborn mm, games. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's surprising uh, all the things we just mentioned. There's not mm -hmm. like a lot of games all of the time for us. Like that. This, mm -hmm. this That's true. Thing, like, it's like a couple a year really hit for me. And it's just that, that even with the volume of games exploding in our lifetime, there's still not like I can't just stick with one. You know, set of games or series. All right, there's a game that's hidden right now. I'll tell you what. Ooh, dang. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Talk I about bet. that on another episode. <laughs> I think I know which one you mean, and I'm excited to jump into that as well. Mm -hmm. um, man, Last of Us Part 2 just drags on, I think, a little bit towards the end. Anyway. Yeah. That brings us to Video Game 20 Questions. Hopefully, Tina will have time to sit in. Yeah, I no longer have a hard out. I snuck a oh, slack cool. to John. We're good. good. We're going to no win. Hard out. I mean, uh, we're good. Our suggestion this week comes from Sam from Minnesota. Okay. okay. The um, Minnesota version. Ooh, yeah, I was worried I blacked out and sent you a 20 question. <laughs> which would actually be like totally fair. It would still be, yeah, because if you blacked out, yeah, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Sam's drunk emailing me 20 question suggestions. <laughs> I love it. Uh, okay, let the questioning begin. Hmm. It's better than coming to your house and giving them to you. <laughs> All right, so an on theme first question uh, is this an Amini game? Uh, not really from the description you just provided. Okay. Yeah, well, I don't think it is. Uh, is this game from before the year 2000? No. Okay. So more recent game. Do you get to pick your character in this game? No. It wouldn't be because I mentioned... RPGs in my in a mini game. I, I cover a lot. Of thing. Yeah, it can't be. Act. It can't be a first person. Wait, Damon, let's let's fact check this. It can't be a first person shooter. It can't be an open world game. Can't be a horror game. Can't be an RPG. <laughs> you can't cross out that many. <laughs> I stand by. I stand by my response. There you go. See, that was a great question. <laughs> it was a cheat question. Mm -hmm. uh, where are we at? Does this have multiplayer? Yes. Hmm. You can't choose your character, huh? Oh, is yeah. this predominantly considered a PlayStation game? No. That's okay. five. It's a part of a series? Yes. Okay. Is it the first entry in a series? Technic well, for us it was. How about that? Cool. Oh, okay. So interesting. Originally okay. released in Japan, maybe? Hmm. Do we want to ask that next? Like where it was developed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. Is this, a, is this developed in Japan? Yes. Okay. Japanese game, first time stateside, multiplayer. Series. Japanese multiplayer game. Hmm. I know, but it could be like a, it has a multiplayer mode, but not necessarily predominantly multiplayer. Is this a Nintendo game? Yes. Okay. No. Is, uh, there a, is there a, um, a game in the series on the Switch? No, that's 10. Okay. Game is okay. So, no Switch, a Nintendo multiplayer game. First time in the States. Is this a sports game? <laughs> no. Okay. Ooh. That means it's like questionable, though. Like a racing game? Is a racing game a sports game? Yeah, or snowboarding. Mm hmm. Um, I would count that as a sports game. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But racing is more questionable. Yeah, I guess it's extreme sports as opposed to is wheel there, sports. <laughs> wheel is there sports? a Japanese multiplayer racing game that didn't come to the U.S.? Initially? Predominantly Nintendo. 
เงินใช่ไหมครับ I I'm there's also punching and wrestling um oh yes the punching genre <laughs> Nintendo makes punching games that's right um uh it, was this a a handheld game no okay so on consoles one of the consoles does this have motion uh, controls no does this star mario characters no okay uh, oh does this have characters in smash brothers are characters from this game in smash brothers yeah. Yeah. yes that's oh, 15 okay. That's fifteen. Okay, so uh, okay, so a Nintendo game that is Nintendo with a Smash crossover. This should be up your alley, Zach. I know <laughs> Nintendo. Nintendo with multiplayer game. <laughs> There's a lot of characters in Smash Brothers now. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't really narrow it down. Uh, but it means it's not something like you know. That I'm we getting hung up. up. I'm getting hung up with the idea that it, the first iteration didn't come stateside. Yeah, I can't think of what that would be based Fire on Emblem. that. But Fire Emblem was not multiplayer. There might have been turn turn changing off versions of it or something. Ah, oh, yes, turn changing off. <laughs> it, well, it's not a sports. I mean, it doesn't sound very sportsy. Well, yeah, although Fire Emblem Nintendo. features a lot of horseback riding, which is a sport. Yeah, that's there true. There you go. But I method. doubt Damon said would have gone there. So that's right. <laughs> um, um, okay, well, we can narrow down because it's it's not a sports game, but it might be borderline sports game based off of Damon's reaction. But we can still narrow uh, down the genre. Animal Crossing came out in Japan first. That's true. And it does have multiplayer. It's certainly it does have not characters in Smash. You do run, um, but you can pick your character. Well, well, kind of. I suppose you customize your character. I, yeah, and the fact that Damon was like kind of wishy washy on the sports answer is yeah. questionable. Sometimes you he just have... needs to rethink, though. It's not always yeah. Hmm. A matter of it being borderline. Sometimes Same is just right off camera too, and he's just chuckling. Yeah, he's yeah. just oh, huh. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> distracted. <laughs> um, I don't know where to go from here. Is this does this yeah. have real, does this have cartoony graphics? Is something we could ask something like that? Mm, don't they all? No, yeah. not necessarily. Um, is, yeah, does this game have realistic graphics? Uh, n- no. No. Okay. That's 16. Okay. Is this a 16? We're on 16? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Do you um, fight people or is there combat in this game? Wait, well, you just asked two questions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is there like an element to where you are fighting other things? What he's trying to say is that you might not be fighting people. Right. Yeah. That's why I left it as like open ended as yeah. things, creatures. Are you, ask- are you asking if there's. Yeah. Okay, like, someone, asked, someone asked the question is, again. Is there combat in this game? Yes. Okay. okay. So, combat. so probably not any kind of racing. It's not, or it's not on the Switch, so let's think about some Wii, Wii U, GameCube games. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess we didn't ask if it was Nintendo first party. We just asked if it was on a Nintendo system. Yep. No, you said, is this a Nintendo game? Okay. Yeah, but that could, that. couldn't that be interpreted by published or developed? I, I don't think Damie would be that that critical of that question. I, mean, I think uh, Nintendo published this is pretty. This is a hundred percent Nintendo game. Okay. Oh, Smash, Smash, Smash Brothers. Brothers. Smash. Yeah. Um. And there's not a version on Switch. I guess that would help us eliminate some of these. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Uh. Do. You is there any any kind of racing involved? No. Okay, so it's not a wave race game. Would it help to know if you play as a human? No, not at this point. Um, Why you think it's definitely a human? I think it's a Star Fox game. That's not a sports. That's not a sporty game. But something that's like. Fly. Sim, like a sim, yeah, could be kind of borderline interpreted by some people. Well, pilot wings would have been sixty-four. That would be too early for yeah. this. Is there flying in this game? Well, there's also Wii Sports Resort as a sporty, weird game. But that would be motion controls. Motion controls, yeah, yeah. Because it could yeah. be like Star Fox Adventures. 
But, that, uh, but the first, but, oh, the no, first but that wasn't developed in Japan, so it can't be. It, uh, yeah, that's true. Hmm. Do you want to go the flying route? Would that help? We have one yeah. question and then a guess. And a guess. Oh, yeah. boy, yeah. I, I just, I just, I just gotta be careful with this one. I don't think we're going to get it at this point. So we also have the cheat. Have we mentioned yeah, this game we yet? Mentioned yeah, I think we have to. Let's do it. Have, have we, we mentioned, mentioned this game yet? yet? No. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's an not. interesting outcome. Guess something <laughs> random. I don't even know. Because I don't know what, what era this game is even. You know, it's a Nintendo game with combat. Part uh, of series. Excite Truck. Part of a series. Has multiplayer. Yep. Uh, cartoonish graphics. No motion controls. You can't choose your character. And your one big hint is like, why? What reason could I possibly have to have stumbled on the sports question? Mm. Uh, yeah. It could still be a flying sim related thing. I, I feel like you have enough information Brain to realistically training? guess it. No, it's got to be more sports related. So flying probably is within that realm because it would be yeah, racing yeah. or it would be flying. Well, is what a, what, what flying game thing. do you think that it is? If, if you think that it's a flying game, what flying game is it? Go through your Smash characters who fly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's only Star Fox, so it would be really tough for us to get or that. Pilot Wings, yeah. She has a suggestion. Is, uh, is um, it, should we just, I don't know. Should we just get, guess, it's not a Pilot Wings game. It's too late for that. What, what, wait, hold on. So let, let's just focus on a system like like we, and like if you think about the because we know it's not handheld. So if you think but about the also, Wii, there's also no motion control, so it's probably not a Wii game. Yeah, but it could be like one of the weird platformy games. You know, well, okay. What, what, what about games GameCube? Like, let's just think of a Nintendo game that was on GameCube that we haven't said yet. Like, there's there's four swords. Those have like you know a bunch of multiplayer in it. You mm-hmm. don't you get to choose the color of Link. Uh, there's uh, Pac Man, uh, whatever. Versus, versus Pac-Man yeah. versus, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wouldn't sports stumble on that on either of them. No. no. Man, was there a 1080 on GameCube? Well, that would definitely be a sports game. And it's not Mario Party because you said there's no Mario characters in it. Mm-hmm. All right. Wario I think yeah. I was gonna say I think we gotta throw in the towel. Oh I don't man. Know. All right, we give up. It is Pokemon Stadium. Oh. Okay. Yeah, that wasn't going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, Pokemon. Pokemon Stadium. Wow. Released in the year 2000. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Turn based fighting combat game. Okay. Mm-hmm. If we'd asked mm-hmm. if it was developed by Nintendo, we might have gotten that one. Uh, well, I, mean, I don't think it was developed by Nintendo. It was uh, EAD. Was it really? Pokemon Stadium? Yeah. Oh, so weird. I played yeah. a lot of that game, a lot of it. Well, where were you the past five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just didn't. I didn't think to go Pokemon and like no, the me neither. thing is funny now, and also the do you mm-hmm. battle? Uh, do you fight things? Right? Mm-hmm. Like you asked that, and that's when he was like, "Do you fight that. animals?" Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pokemon, that's really good. Mm-hmm. Ah, okay, bummer. Oh well, well. everybody there's gets always. One. There's always next week. Thank also, you for... that, that came out in two thousand. Yeah. Wow, yeah. right on the cusp. That's always really hard for us to get things that are at the turn of the century. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the suggestion. Sam from Minnesota. Minnesota Sam. Uh, yeah, you can, you can at me. You can feel That's free true. to add. Feel it's free been to a while since I've at Arizona Sam. Arizona Sam. Yeah. Uh, listeners, viewers, if you have your own suggestions for 20 questions, email them to me at gamescoop at IGN.com. That is all the scoops that we have for you this week. Uh, thank you to Tina, Sam, and Zach. We will be back next week with more delicious scoops for you. My name is Damon. This is IGN Game Scoop, and we're out.